happening. But to change a society, I suppose everybody needs to be taking a stand against sexual violence. Havan Amara there, who spoke of the subtle messages we receive, which she thinks implies that rape is OK. Are then there serious issues of harassment which are brushed off and not taken seriously? Or is there too much panic around rape? Let us know what you think. You can email, text, call or use social media to get in touch. We're joined now by the lawyer and author of the book Why Rape Culture is a Dangerous Myth, Luke Gittos, and also by Dr Julia Long, who's a feminist campaigner and sociology lecturer. Welcome to the programme, both of you. Thanks for joining us. Yeah. Um, Luke, I was struck by something in your book where you say there is a contemporary panic around rape culture that often bears little resemblance to the reality of rape. What do you mean when you talk about rape culture and the panic that you think surrounds it? Well, I mean that the panic that we are currently inhabiting gives rise to a lot of misinformation in the public debate around rape and sexual violence. Um, one key example is a lot of people believe that the rape conviction rate is unusually low and that juries will not believe uh, complainants when they get to court. Actually, the opposite is true. The rape conviction rate is high. It's currently around 56%. Juries are more likely to believe complainants uh, than they are to uh, disbelieve them. And I'm afraid in my work, I've seen how these myths um, impact on society's ability to deal with rape and sexual violence because women are put off from coming to court even though they may have a strong case and they're put off from engaging in the process because they believe certain facts which are demonstrably untrue. Julia? Um, well, I think uh, Luke's been rather selective in his uh, choice of statistics there because we also need to talk about the attrition rate um, in, in the case of rape and sexual assault and we need to talk about the fact that many, many women do not report rape. Um, it's estimated that only around 10 to 15 percent of women who've experienced rape and sexual violence actually report rape. And there are all sorts of issues around rape statistics and the first chapter of the book is why we should move on from treating rape as a numbers game. But do you, get, do you get Julia's point that actually all the rape centres and people who deal with women who, who are coming to them saying I need help are saying that the problem is a lot bigger than the official statistics seem to suggest. I've no doubt that that's the case. I've no doubt there's an enormous amount of women who aren't getting the services that they need. Mm. Um, the problem is that we don't have an open and robust and frank debate about how to deal with this problem. That and that's really what we need. Claire. Well, one of the things that I, I do a lot of uh, talks in sixth forms and universities, and one of the things that's really struck me over recent years is how frightened young women are about the prospect of being raped or sexual assault. And I think in that sense, I recognise something in what Luke said in, in actually uh, having read some of the book. Um, in the sense that, that there's a kind of this myth that, that, that men are sort of out to get you and that you're, you should be constantly frightened. And this sort of discussion about rape culture, which has been used to describe everything from the lyrics of songs, famously that Blurred Lines song, uh, all, uh, which has been banned from campuses, but uh, rugby club banter, all sorts of things, which is called rapey, which will lead to rape. I think that that puts us in this situation where all young women are scared that sexual assault is a factor of everyday life and poses young men as a constant threat. Now, who, who as somebody that there is involved is rape culture then? Well, it, actually, I mean, well, so taking, taking things like catcalling and the yes. rugby songs well, and, and the, the, the lyrics in, in some yes. in some songs. It, 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 it's, 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 okay. it's particularly taken off in uh, student campuses that there's a thing called rape culture. But Laura Bates from um, uh, uh, Everyday Sexism has said there is a rape culture. You only have to read, uh, particularly The Guardian, but not only, The Guardian newspaper, The New Statesman. They're constantly talking about the hidden problem of a rape culture, oh. where rape is everywhere, stalking us, right. and we have to be frightened. Um, I had a very, I've asked younger women, uh, because I think that's important, to ask them what are they experiencing, because I don't see a rape culture, and they say, yeah, there is one. And it's interesting to me, uh, if you perceive something to be real, uh, the question has to be asked, how do you get the perception? That's what's important. People are getting anecdotal evidence. They're also getting their own experience. I was with a younger friend of, of mine walking through Waterloo too. This has never happened to me before. Well, she was wearing a dress and heels. There were five guys who followed us, literally, calling out after her. Uh, it was horrific. I've never seen anything like this before. And, and we got on the train, mm -hmm. and the guy started banging on the window. And I looked at her, and I said, what the? And she said, this happens all the time. And that is sexual and intimidation. Well, it yeah. is, and it's an awful thing to experience. But what we need to be sure about is to distinguish between people's experiences and the broader objective reality of this situation, because otherwise we have no chance of engaging with the real problems which exist. The same-sex train carriages example is a classic example. We know that sexual violence is committed by a minority of men. It's not the majority of men. And these, this minority tend to be repeat offenders. What we're dealing with here is a minority of men. And I think that not just women, but both men and women should not have to radically reorientate the way they live in a free society around the threat posed by what is a very small minority of men. And I think the real risk is inherent in this continuum idea is that for that minority that do go out and choose to commit these awful acts of violence and degradation against women, 
we actually see that as less serious because we say, well, any man has the potential to become a, a sexually violent person if he's given the Why opportunity. Why would you see it less I serious? Really I mean, uh, well, rape, what I'm rape is rape, is, and, and, and it is appalling yeah. in whatever circumstance and whatever well, culture. Of course, absolutely. But what I'm suggesting is that by saying that all men are potentially capable of committing sexual oh, violence, so we say that no. actually uh, the minority of men that do go out and do commit these awful crimes, that somehow any man is capable of doing all right, are you saying crime. all men are predators? Can I, can I come in all here? I predators? think one of the, I think um, what seems to me very troubling about the book that Luke has written is that he it, he seems to have ignored four decades of of um, activism, of, of feminist scholarship in this area, and of services provided to women that have um, that have helped to get away from this myth of the kind of you know the stranger rape as being the most prevalent form of rape. We know that women are generally um, generally speaking overwhelmingly. Um, raped and assaulted by men who are known to them and so this kind of you know, this kind of view and this i think rather um rather trivializing view of saying that you know that um that um that there there isn't uh you know a, um, a very high prevalence of rape and sexual assault but is it, actually okay, flying in the face of, what, his point, of what we know that, can you see his point that it is a minority of men who are doing this and what's happening um, is that we are creating a climate of fear amongst women that the potential exists no, no one, no for one, all men no, one's, no, one, no there's no we to create a climate of fear women are responding to their experience mm. and they're talking to each other. But I think mm. that four decades mm. of feminist scholarship have sadly betrayed many of the great virtues of the women's liberation movement by actually talking up the threat of rape, broadening out the, and expanding the definition of what constitutes rape in a way which I find uh, involves all sorts of things from regretted sex to all sorts of encounters that that's, are difficult and I actually think that it's been a betrayal of a movement which started right. off to say that young women should not be frightened okay. and now we've scared all right. To, to I think not to try to um, to frame the women's movement as, as, or the feminist movement as being the problem is absolutely to, to shoot some aspect of it. It's, it's the opposite I, of it. Right? You will have okay. to finish this off another time. <laughs> Thank you very much because it, it could go on. Thank you for all your reactions at home too. Do keep them coming in.